The News 4 Rundown is sponsored by FH Fur. Cutting down on Metro fare jumpers, new information shows the transit agency's new gates at rail stations have been a success. So what comes next? Some school bus riders in Maryland may find themselves without a ride on the first day of school. The driver dispute that's led to a transportation standstill. And high school senior superlative success. More than a decade after classmates were voted most likely to teach at that high school, they're now teaching at that high school. I was like, well, wouldn't that be funny if I got the job and like that superlative came true? And it did. News 4's Amy Cho found out how they both ended up back at the school they graduated from 16 years later. You're watching the News 4 Rundown. And thanks for joining us for the Rundown, our newscast streaming for you. I'm Jim Adley. I'm Sean Yancey. It's Tuesday, August 22nd. We begin tonight with a look at some of the top stories we're following. A shooting on I-66 in Fairfax County, Virginia, backed up traffic for miles this afternoon. Police say the driver in a white Honda sedan shot at a black Honda around 1 p.m. Police arrested someone at the scene, but it's not clear how that person was involved. This happened in the eastbound lanes of 66, about a mile west of Route 29 in Centerville. The first of former President Trump's co-defendants in Georgia's election interference case have surrendered. Trump's former lawyer John Eastman and Republican poll watcher Scott Hall both turned themselves in today. Trump and 18 other defendants were recently charged with racketeering and other crimes over alleged efforts to overturn Trump's loss in Georgia to jo President Biden. Giant Food is closing its three home delivery fulfillment centers in Hanover, Maryland, Manassas, Virginia, and Milford, Delaware. It says the rising costs are preventing it from meeting customer needs. The company told WTOP the move could affect about 400 jobs, but those employees could also be hired elsewhere within the company. Now to new developments in the flooding at a doggy daycare in the district that killed 10 dogs. Yeah, district officials are now acknowledging some errors were made in dispatching first responders last Monday to district dogs on Rhode Island Avenue. We know the first call for help came about 506 Monday afternoon, but rescue teams didn't start to make entry to the facility for at least another 20 minutes. Today News 4 spoke with the person who made the first 911 call for help. They told our Mark Seagraves they blamed themselves until yesterday. Did I convey a sense of emergency? Did I tell them that people and animals were trapped in there? It did leave me with guilt. I felt I felt as though I was being held responsible in some ways. And my mental health like took a huge hit, honestly. And they felt guilty until DC leaders released the transcript of the 911 calls Monday. The calls revealed the caller and all the other callers were clear about the level of danger. The 911 operator assured both callers that rescue units were being dispatched and help was on the way. The head of the 911 call center admitted the dispatchers made at least two errors, including saying a dispatcher misspoke when they called the situation a water leak. What I am saying is we could have done things differently. This was an unprecedented event. And so now as we look at what we could have done differently, we are making changes. It's unclear if a faster response time by rescue teams would have saved any of those dogs. We're now learning that all 10 dogs that died in the flash flood were in cages. Metro's brand new fare gates and rail stations have been successful in dramatically reducing the number of fare jumpers. Yeah, the agency tells us it was losing tens of millions of dollars every year due to people jumping those gates. Our transportation reporter Adam Tuss breaks down the numbers. Metro fare evaders may have met their match. The transit agency says there's been a 70 to 85% reduction in fare evasion at stations that have these new gates. The gates are taller, 55 inches, and twice as strong as the original prototypes, nearly half the height of a standard basketball hoop, 200 times stronger than glass, 
Metro GM Randy Clark more than pleased with what he says is a successful rollout of the gates. They're clearly making a tangible difference in reducing fare evasion. And take a look at these numbers just released from Metro that show how much fare evasion is down at certain stations, down 71% at Fort Totten in Pentagon City, down 78% in Bethesda, 74% down at Vienna, an 84% decline at Mount Vernon Square and down 72% at Addison Road. The GM with us here at Mount Vernon Square, and he wanted to show us the strength of the gates. Try to push through one of these gates. Like, like that is a... Yeah. Yeah, okay. no, it's hard. Like I don't I'm, want I don't want to break it, but... Like, there you go. Like, That's how hard I'm, you have to actually try. And I'm, I'm not a big, big guy, but I'm not a small guy. Um, and, you know, that is a very difficult thing to push through. You can see the double reinforced hinges, the motors, very resilient. Yeah. So perfect now. Are we still going to get somebody that potentially could get over? Of, of course, because we're not building a full wall. Right. But, yeah, but, that's I mean, hard. That is a sturdy, sturdy gate. Now, the new gates don't come without controversy. Some criticize the millions in cost, saying Metro could simply hire more police officers to keep an eye on the system. There should be more officers down in the station and on trains. You know, more so than worrying about uh, fare jumpers. But Metro says fare evasion costs the transit agency about $40 million every year. And with this new feedback about the success of the gates, there are now plans to put them all across the system. At Mount Vernon Square, Adam Tuss, News 4. A major new renewable energy project is officially on the way in Northern Virginia. Today was the groundbreaking for the Dulles Solar and Storage Project here at Dulles International Airport. Now this project will generate enough clean energy to power more than 37,000 Virginia homes. The partnership between Dominion and the Metropolitan Airport Authority is the largest clean energy project at an airport in the country. It will also provide 18 electro buses, electric buses and 50 other EVs to be used for Dulles operations. The project is funded in part with funds from President Biden's Inflation Reduction Act. It's expected to support hundreds of jobs in Loudoun County and should be complete by late 2026. All right, we're getting you ready for school and just days before the start of the school year, there is a concern that buses won't be rolling for students in Charles County Public Schools in Maryland come Monday. The school district and the union that represents bus contractors are at odds over a number of issues, including better pay. News 4's Dominique Moody breaks down what this could mean for your kids and what it will take to reach a deal. On August 28th, the 24 school bus contractors may not be operating. Days before the 2023 through 2024 school year begins in Charles County, a standoff is brewing between the county's school bus drivers and the association that represents them and the school system. A multi-year contract is a must to give our 458 employees and families a sense of security as well as our own families to continue doing what we love. For the second time in three years, all parties are going back to the drawing board to seek an agreement. Six days before buses are expected to pull off the lot for the first day of classes. Today, the association detailed what it is they're asking for, including an eight hour workday, a multi-year contract, job security for local bus drivers, and equity in pay. The association says its bus drivers are leaving to go to other counties with higher wages and better job security. It's going to be a struggle to start the school year. I'll be on the bus, but we have, I know for a fact it's impacted my business. Last week, Charles County Public Schools announced a 5% cost of living increase for contracted drivers and attendants, up from the 2% initially offered. So the question on the minds of drivers, the association, contractors, as well as the school system is what's going to happen on August 28th? Well, the hope is for a resolution to be in place. But frankly, these buses, they could not move come next Monday. We may not be able to run, but that's why we're here to make sure that we're notifying the parents, the students, and anybody else that's involved. I definitely expect to have a resolution, some resolution, and then that may mean that we can run. You know, even if we say, go ahead, or we're told, go ahead and run the buses, and we know that we're still working together and trying to get it resolved. In Charles County, Dominique Moody, News 4. And we are still waiting to hear back from the Charles County School Board, so look for updates on our website. 
Meantime, in Montgomery County, Maryland, there is a new plan to keep students in class. Today, county leaders announced a new initiative to address chronic absenteeism following the pandemic and to promote consistent attendance for students. For almost two years, we said, if you cough, if you sneeze, if you may look like you have a runny nose, you should stay at home and away from others. And that was important during the pandemic, but we're in a different place now. And so we're gonna have to transform our thinking. Montgomery County Public School students go back to class on Monday. Well, senior superlatives are fun, right? But they don't often pan out. That's not true for two teachers at Our Lady of Good Counsel High School in Olney. News 4's Amy Cho has their story. There are some things in life that are just meant to be. For high school band and orchestra director Tom Kramer, he always knew he wanted to work with kids. I come from a family of teachers, so kind of growing up, that, that's what a lot of people I looked up to, that's what they did. So it kind of was an easy choice for me to kind of follow in their footprints. It's no surprise then that when Tom was a student here at this same high school in 2007, he won the senior superlative, most likely to teach at Good Council. So did his classmate Maureen, but she wasn't quite feeling it. I was convinced that I wouldn't become a teacher. Looking back, there were a lot of signs she missed, but her friends clearly knew. I have always loved kids. I was the one in seventh grade who got my certification to be a babysitter like right away. I probably was meant to be a teacher before I knew I was meant to be a teacher. <laughs> she eventually started teaching theology and was living in Boston. Then she applied for a job here at Good Counsel. I was shocked when I saw Tom was working here and I was like, well, wouldn't that be funny if I got the job and like that superlative came true and it did. <laughs> I've had a lot of people comment and, and be like, you know, we knew it or go 07 or things like that. Yeah, I love 07. Yeah, 07 pride. pride. Yeah. Two teachers making their school proud and proving their friends right after all these years. In Olney, Amy Cho, News 4. I, I love, love the story. story. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's I, so, do too. I just think it's so awesome. Yeah. Do you remember? Did you guys do superlatives in high school? We did. I could not tell you anybody. Really? No. Isn't I think that you wild? were voted most dapper. Da oh, I don't know about that, but I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Still to come, benefits backlog. The News 4 I team looked into why thousands of federal retirees are waiting months for their benefits and what's being done about it. And a pretty exciting preseason victory for the Washington Commanders. Oh, yeah. Why this preseason win is so significant. Whether you need electrical, plumbing, or HVAC service, FH First expert technicians have you covered. Now, during our Super Summer Comfort event, schedule any of FH First award-winning services and score $75 off. That's an astonishing $75 off any electrical, plumbing, or HVAC service now only during FH First Super Summer Comfort event. From flickering lights, pesky leaks, to keeping you cool during the sweltering summer heat, you know who to call. 877-GOFFER-FHFIRE.COM when it's time to retire after a long career, the last thing you want is to wait for your benefits to begin. But the News 4 I team found that is what's happening to thousands of federal workers and their families. The Office of Personnel Management, which oversees benefit programs for millions of federal workers, is facing a substantial backlog in processing retirement cases. Our consumer investigative reporter Susan Hogan and the News 4 I team take a look now at what's been a systematic problem systemic problem and with the with the agency and what's being done about it. I would known him all my life. Diana Kimberlin and her husband Bob would have celebrated 58 years of marriage this December. We met at college in Nashville. Really? Yeah. Love at first sight? For me, <laughs> wasn't for him. <laughs> Bob's career in the federal government eventually brought the couple to Maryland, where he worked as a librarian. Before he retired, he signed up for Diana to receive survivor benefits. I remember the day he came in and told me about it. He, he was excited. 
you know, that he'd found something to take care of me. After Bob passed away last October at the age of 81, Diana contacted the Office of Personnel Management to collect on those benefits. And that's when she says a new heartache began. It was like one hand didn't talk to the other. Diana describes long hold times to speak with a representative and even longer waits to get the paperwork she says she needed to access her benefits. The man said, now the first piece of paper you get is going to be an application and the piece of paper will come in five to six weeks. In the meantime, Diana's bills and her stress piled up. I worried about they turn off the lights if they shut off the water. The I-team found she isn't the only one dealing with delays. My investigative work in the field uh, was counterfeiting and check forgery. Former Secret Service agent Jim Mannion had two careers in the federal government, retiring for good as a civilian in 2017. He didn't immediately file for benefits when he was eligible at 62, thinking it wouldn't be a problem to collect when he was ready. I'm assuming you have figured this would be a fairly easy process. I thought it would. Jim admits his situation was a little more complicated because of his two stints in the federal payroll, but never imagined just how difficult the process would be. I filled out the form. April 4th, Okay. I received a letter, and, and I didn't hear anything until June 15th. End of July, I emailed and that person. And then the end of October. After nine months with no resolution, Jim hired a private consultant to intervene. I just wouldn't have thought it would take this long. A review of federal data shows just how big a problem the processing of retirement applications has become, with OPM facing a backlog of more than 17,000 retirement applications in July. That's down from a height of 36,350 applications in March of last year. But despite some improvements, the agency has seen the average processing time climb in recent months to 85 days, with more complicated cases taking on average 122 days. In a congressional hearing earlier this year, the head of OPM blamed the backlog on historic underfunding of the agency, staffing, and technology, noting OPM is still transitioning from a paper-based system to the digital era. We have not had the resources. It's unacceptable. Maryland Senator Chris Van Hollen yeah, oversees so funding for OPM. They have to put in place new systems. We've been after them to do that. OPM declined an interview with News 4, but said this year they unveiled a quick guide to help retirees prepare to apply for benefits, step-by-step -step videos, and an online chatbot to help answer some of their easier questions. In a statement, it said our end goal is to improve processing times and ensure that retirees get the benefits they earned over their careers in service. I can't say it's all on OPM. Tammy Flanagan is a private benefits consultant and says that because OPM processes applications from several agencies, the breakdown isn't always their fault. But she says OPM should be more transparent with retirees going through the process. That would do a lot to help people feel more secure or more that somebody cares about their long, lengthy, dedicated federal career. That was a letter. With Tammy's help, Jim began receiving most of his retirement benefits about a year after applying, but tells News 4 they're still working out some discrepancies. After falling behind on bills, Diana finally received her husband's death benefits more than four months after applying. What do you think Bob would say about this whole process? I think he would have been so angry and so sad because he really and truly, the day he signed for that annuity, he thought he had done the best for me he could do. Now, experts like Tammy give this advice for federal workers. Take a retirement planning class. Many are offered by the federal government. Try to send your application to your agency at least three months before you plan to retire to give them time to get it to OPM. And make sure there are no discrepancies in your service or application. OPM says more than 20 percent come in with errors that can cause delays. Finally, contact your local member of Congress for help help if you need it. I'm Susan Hogan, News 4 I-Team. Good stuff for so many people in our region. So you, how can you now check out a new 
unique tribute to the Tuskegee Airmen in Northern Virginia. You can find the traveling exhibit telling the story of the legendary Tuskegee Airmen at the Manassas Regional Airport. The Tuskegee Airmen were the first black American aviators in the U.S. Army Air Corps. The exhibit is free. If you'd like to check it out, it'll be on display until Sunday. That should be something to see. Absolutely. You got all weekend. Mm -hmm. All right. Still to come, the celebration for an iconic D.C. restaurant for its 65 years of serving up chili, half smokes, and lots of smiles. Plus. They are the champions, my friends. We are at Tiki on 18th getting ready for restaurant week with the publicly voted winner that you chose as favorite gathering spot. We're going to give it a taste coming up on News 4. Oh, my God. Now, if you are looking to take a little break from cooking and you want to enjoy a night out, you can actually do it on a budget during DC's Summer Restaurant Week. Yeah, that's right. News 4's Tommy McFly has the tough job of taste testing. That way, he can guide you through restaurant week. Today, he's in Adams Morgan in the scene. What does it mean to have an accolade like favorite gathering spot tied to a menu that's so personal to you, making Filipino food? Uh, you should have seen me up on stage. I cried. I bawled my eyes out. We just so happen to have the video. <laughs> <laughs> I need a second. Here at Channel 4, we love visiting gold medalists, winners, champions, and there is no difference here at Tiki on 18th. JoJo, you all just won our publicly voted Rammy Favorite Gathering Spot Award. That was a really good uh, uh, accolade for us to, to get for, for the restaurants. So. If someone's never heard of Tiki on 18th, it's in Adams Morgan. What's the concept of the place? So we are a Tiki bar known for really uh, good, refreshing cocktails and paired with Filipino food. Growing up in the Philippines, I, I really loved going out and eating. What are we digging into here? So right there is uh, our vegetarian spring rolls called lumpiang gulai. Mm. Um, you, you dip it in spicy vinegar. So. You do have spicy vinegar. <laughs> uh, yeah, when, when we say something spicy here, we mean it. Yeah. Yeah, no, we, we, we <laughs> mission accomplished. We, we, we tame it down. Summer Restaurant Week serves up prefixed lunches, brunches, and dinners, kicking off August 28th. This yes. has no meat in it. Yeah, so uh, I, I guess that was one of our smartest moves uh, uh, is uh, to come up with a vegan pancit because uh, we're very popular with, uh, with a JoJo's pancit, which is like crispy pork belly and such. Yeah. But this one definitely caught uh, our neighborhood's uh, attention. Being a favorite gathering spot and hearing from the community, you're offering a little something extra this year? Cocktails and non-alcoholic uh, drinks. For the restaurant week menu, you throw in a cocktail. Absolutely, yeah. And what, what do we got here on the sweets? Because this is also included in the restaurant. Yeah, so this is uh, my wife's creation. So my wife does our desserts. Um, so this is the ube cheesecake. My gosh. So cheesecake is not really a Filipino item, but ube is, and mm -hmm. it seems to be the hit. Compliments to your wife for sure. Yeah. If you're making a reservation for Restaurant Week, check out Tiki on 18th here in Adams Morgan. I'm Tommy McFly, News 4. Actually, more cheesecake as well. Looks delicious. Cheesecake. And I like those glasses. I, I think love that the makes little... the drinks taste even better. Is that... Huh? <laughs> that cheesecake the, was an interesting the, color. The, the glasses it? make the drinks taste better. I think they look pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Summer Restaurant Week kicks off Monday, August 28th. So get your reservations in. Brunch and lunch will cost you about $25 a person. And a dinner can range from $40 to $55. They are usually prefixed menus, so check them out. I think you owe me a dinner. I'm going to $55. Uh, man, of course just you so would. You know. Of course. I'll take you to lunch, too. <laughs> Okay. That's about it. <laughs> all right, uh, finally tonight, people came from all over to help Ben's Chili Bowl celebrate 65 yeah. years. And one of our favorites, too. The iconic business hosted a block party today down at their original U Street location. They treated customers to free chili and half smokes. They also shared their memories about what the restaurant has meant to them over the years. Yeah, Virginia and Ben Ali first opened up the Chili Bowl back in 1958 when D.C. was still a segregated city. The U Street Corridor was dubbed Black Broadway for its abundance of black-owned businesses, including movie theaters and music venues. Mm -hmm. a, certainly a special day for them. This is a look back then uh, at the historic uh, U Street Corridor back then. 
Um, so many, many, many memories and so much history. Yeah. There's the original sign outside of Ben's Chili Bowl oh, there. Those black and white pigs. Absolutely. And the Virginia Ali too, way back in the She's day. What a beautiful woman. A beautiful woman inside yeah. and yeah. out. That's She's what I love great. about her. All right, well, that'll do it for the News 4 Rundown. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Sean Yancey. And I'm Jim Antley. We'll see you right back here tomorrow.